at least we're trying to learn now that we're a little bit older. Yeah, it's. it's... They had a payload that was talking at one time. I think it was like six billion dollars in of something. And there was a like you said, there was a fund that was appropriated into and then they had to apply and do all these hoop jumping to get funds and stuff. So right? people who yeah, are but affected. people that were affected by it, yes, exactly. So are you gonna try to do I, that? Well, I didn't actually no. get there at the time, okay. but I grew up there. Oh. Not. Like literally the area I grew up in, and my brother went out there and only about 10 like not even 10 years ago, went out there and he just like told me how much it just told like the, our main area used to be nothing but seafood warehouses and going out and doing seafood, you know. And like now all they can do out there is pretty much do tourists, you know, attract the tourists. And where we lived at, yes, it was Florida. Wasn't exactly the prettiest part of Florida, you know. So, we actually had a solar right on the White House and everything, but the very next president pulled it off. Yeah, when are we going to stop this? A little bit. Wait, just one. Okay, I think we're we're all good. So, uh, we'll go ahead and get started today, and. Um, uh, today is the 22nd, so um, all I'm going to do today is really talk about the event, and that's my only uh, bit of, uh, of content for the day, and this is your, as I mentioned in my uh, preview note, in Brightspace, this is really your chance to ask whatever questions you want to ask, and I'll go over as much material as we can. Um, I have to leave this up here because um, it's the only way to get the camera to invoke. We can't, uh, to, to stay up, we, we just can't do it without the projector running. So to the third exam, it's going to be available. Um, and I'll probably, I usually make these available on Thursday. I'll probably just make it available today. It's, it's done. It's ready to go. And that way, I'll probably do it sometime after class is over today. I'll just simply make it available. And so you've got until Sunday to do it. Usually the clock stops at 11.59. Sometimes the system will let you go on. Sometimes it doesn't. And I, as I understand, too, that sometimes the system will let you stop and go back in. But I don't know if that's the case or not. And I haven't really gotten a good answer from uh, anybody in 
you know, technical area about this. Maybe I should, maybe I'm not talking to the right people, but uh, it's really designed to be taken in one sitting. And so the exam itself is going to cover these chapters. I'll talk about that in a minute. And there's going to be it's going to be the identical format as the first two exams, so multiple choice, 40 of these multiple choice questions, and they're worth two and a half points each, and so the exam itself is worth 100 points in total, and you have a, a time frame of 90 minutes to do it, so I think that is probably a, a, uh, a good enough time window, and, and because it's an online exam, you'll have any kind of resource available for you to use, including the text, including uh, lecture notes, including my PowerPoint slides, including anything that you want to uh, to use for that, so, okay. So that's the plan. Now let's talk about the, the chapters that we're gonna be covering here. It looks like a lot, a lot of these are related, to one, particularly with these last two. Chapters 12 and 13 really were, in, in a lot of textbooks and a lot of my class discussions, really one subject, externalities. And so chapters 12 and 13 covered that. And then eight, nine, and 10 are all related to this idea of market structure. And that is, this market, market structure is really sort of the main theme of this particular um, segment of the class. Chapter eight is the perfect competition. That's one extreme point of the uh, of the compass. The other extreme point is monopoly. And then the last two structures are, are joined together in, in chapter 10. That's monopolistic competition and oligopoly. And remember, monopolistic competition is a hybrid of both perfect competition and monopoly, which seems like it's an oxymoron, but really it works in the sense that from a time frame standpoint, to the extent that a firm can enjoy quote unquote monopoly pricing, even though it's operating in an environment, lots of competition, low barriers to entry, free entry and exit into and out of the market, nonetheless, the pricing can be remain high, mostly because of uh, the differentiation of the product. Product branding is a very powerful thing, very powerful. And so as a result, uh, being able to, to differentiate your products is good. Also included in that chapter 10 is oligopoly, which is a structure that we, we tend to think of, and I, I know I emphasize this again, but we think of it as big, big business, not that monopolies are not big business, not that some monopolies are competitive firms or even perfectly competitive firms can be big. But we're talking about very few firms operating in that particular market simply because of the fact that they've been in that market so long. Sometimes it takes a while to break in. Sometimes, frankly, it just so, it's so darn expensive to enter a market, which is why you have very few new competitors ever enter a, a, an industry like aerospace or, um, uh, you know, Defense contracting, uh, even things like, like uh, biotechnology, these are really expensive structures. Now, I know there's a lot more economic financial capital floating around out there that makes it a little bit more possible, which is why some people argue that monopolies are sort of doomed to fail in the long run. But nonetheless, we will talk a bit more about monopolies as we review today. Chapter 11 sort of summed up all this, particularly dealing with the, the negative impacts of, of monopolization. And then that sort of really was a good sort of bridge chapter to this general notion of what we call market failure. And there's a question on the exam dealing with what's known as market failure. And I define market failure as being this sort of broad category of, of analysis that takes into account the idea that, and recognizes, I should say, that markets don't always work efficiently, that it's private markets left to their own devices without some sort of government intervention, refereeing, control, whatever you want to call it, uh, because they don't always allocate up on it. And sometimes we have that are not efficient. And the first of these we really got into, but by, but by no means the last, is this topic of externalities and what we call spillovers, okay? But there are others as well. We're going to get to as we come back next week, we'll talk more about things like public goods. We need public goods because there's nobody who's going to start a private police force, probably. Uh, if, we, if they do, you got to wonder how they're going to get paid, right? So we have to have police and fire and ambulance and uh, the alphabet soup of agencies that help sort of make life livable, all right? So, so we need those, but the, the, the private market simply can't, won't, nor do we really want uh, the private market to supply some of these things. And again, what's interesting about that topic is it's very current. And I think a lot of, I, I think econ is meaningful when it's very current and relevant to our lives. And, I, and we're hearing a lot, uh, in, particularly among voices in politics about trying to privatize a lot of activities. And what that's, that, what, that's the area we're gonna get into. Uh, more next time. Okay, but let's talk about these chapters here. The exam is done. Let's talk about what some of the what the exam are going to be about. And if, to the extent that you want me to cover anything in particular that I'm forgetting or not covering sufficiently, then let me know, and I'll be more than happy to uh, to comply with what you want to know. So there are a number of questions dealing with um, market structure. It's probably, I would say, maybe. 
probably a good um, half of the exam deals with those first three chapters, eight, nine, and 10. And that's, which makes sense because it's, there are six chapters in all. I know it sounds like a lot, but really they, they go fairly quickly. Chapter 11 is a really brief chapter and there's not really anything that's very complicated about chapter 11. And, and there won't be very much of the exam out of this. And I'll, I'll, I'll talk about what you need to know out of chapter 11. Chapter 11 really is probably better understood more from a legal standpoint than an economic standpoint, mostly because it's it's directly tied in with legal uh, uh, legal enforcement, legal uh, you know, compliance, and some of which sort of extends beyond what's going on in econ. And then the rest deals with externalities. And so let's talk about what we need to know for the exam. So there's a number of questions about cost. Now, remember, ch chapter seven was this chapter that sort of kicked off this discussion of cost. And we got it. And I said it was probably the most complicated chapter in the book. And I, I, I hope you would agree with that, although I suppose it depends on your own particular opinion. But, but chapter seven is not going to be directly covered on this exam. But as I have been, exams are not comprehensive in nature. They just simply take the material from the last exam. Nonetheless, some of the ideas carry over. They certainly carry over with respect to cost. And remember one thing that's really important to know here is when we talk about cost of production, we need to understand that, that when we talk about those, the supply curve, the supply curve for all firms in all industries is the same as the marginal cost curve, okay? Supply and marginal cost are essentially one and the same. But what makes it a little bit different in the case of perfect competition is the fact of this. In perfect competition, you've got a vertical demand curve so in other words, the, the demand curve is, is, is the same as the marginal revenue curve. This is important to know. This is only a perfect competition, right? Only a perfect competition. In fact, we lumped together those last three structures and said one of the, we, we said, okay, monopoly, monopolistic competition, and oligopoly are all characterized by being not perfectly competitive, and therefore we call it imperfectly competitive. But where the rubber meets the road is this issue of the marginal revenue curve. Not the marginal cost curve. The marginal cost curve is simply the supply curve for all firms in, in all industries. But what's different here is if the demand curve equals the marginal revenue curve in, in perfect competition, then think about what output level every firm and every industry is seeking to produce. And we go back to this idea of what the motivations are in terms of, of business firms. What are they out to do? Well, if we think that all actors are engaging in what's called maximizing behavior, then we're saying business firms maximize their, their profit, that's the, the objective, that's why they exist primarily. And I know that that's a, a little bit of uh, an overly simple view because I know businesses have gotten more involved in, in weighing in on social issues. And I talked a bit about that uh, in class, but primarily economists will still bring us back to things which are measurable. And that is, even the firms that are very socially conscious and, and involved in, in local and state issues still are out to maximize profit. And if they're not, usually, uh, the investment community will get on them. But it's this point at which marginal revenue is marginal cost. It's a really important thing to know, okay? Well, in perfect competition, if, if, if demand equals marginal revenue and the price of the good is equivalent to marginal revenue, right? Then what can we say about perfect competition? We can say in perfect competition that if the price equals the same as the marginal revenue, which equals the same as the marginal cost. And that's where the firm is going to produce its, uh, its profit maximizing quantity. That's an important thing. This is the only structure which that is the case. And if you, okay, now if you think about this, you're saying, okay, well, wait a minute. If marginal revenue is marginal cost, that must, must mean that for every, every unit that we produce, we have a cost of producing that unit. And we, if we sell that unit, we get an amount of marginal revenue, which is equivalent to the price. It must mean we're getting zero profit as a result. And the answer is yes, you are. So we say that in perfect competition, long run economic profit, is considered to be not possible. The reason it's not possible is for all these reasons, all these things that, that, that define perfect competition, very low entry barriers. Firms can come in, leave, come in, leave. The product itself, there's nothing special about it. It's what we call undifferentiated. It's commoditized. It's things like oil, oil drilling, potatoes. Agricultural output uh, is, is almost the perfect example of a perfectly competitive industry where you've got just corn alone, we've got something like 316,000 corn farmers in the country. That's a pretty widely dispersed uh, industry. You know, we talked about egg farmers. Since there's been so much discussion about eggs, and people say, well, look at the price of eggs. It's a monopoly price. Not really. It's more of a supply issue. We're already starting to see egg prices fall. Why? Because we've got 19,000 egg producers, and they all would like to produce, produce, produce in order to grab those high prices. But as they do it, 
supply curve shifts right, brings the price down, that price axis, and they move down along that price axis, okay? So in perfect competition, this is the issue, and zero economic profit is what's expected. And so, you know, the question, it always begs the question, okay, well, why would anybody want to, again, again buy simple means profit? It always begs the question, why would anybody want to do this? And, and the answer is, well, because you could have still some accounting profit. Because remember, accounting profit does not include opportunity costs or implicit costs. Accounting profit is always going to be greater than economic profit, simply because there's another layer of cost being dumped into this calculation that's implicit costs or more specifically the cost of the next best thing that that producer can be, can be doing. And in the case of agriculture, it's sort of a, it's a unique case in its own right, given the fact that a lot of farming operations are inherited. They've been going on for generations after generation. And if you've got a couple thousand acres like my family does, it's not, what are we going to do with 2,000 acres? But farm it, and there's not a whole lot. You know, my grandfather started selling it off to developers, uh, you know, um, and uh, he wasn't going to win any environmental awards. But, uh, you know, they're like, I mean, that's a lot of acreage. And so as a result, you've got to do something with it. You've got to do something in order to, at the very minimum, pay your property taxes and, and, and to pay for the equipment that is inherent in, in any kind of farm operation or any kind of operation for that matter. Those fixed costs that result from that. So economic profit is always going to be less, but you can still be earning an accounting profit. In other words, earning a living doing what you're doing, even though that, that living might be fairly volatile as a result. So just be aware of what is going on there. There are a couple of questions on the exam that will deal with, um, we'll, we'll illustrate some, some graphs and some tables that you'll want to be able to interpret, but it's, they're going to be dealing with perfect competition, and there's going to be a lot of data. And so don't, don't get too intimidated by a table full of a lot of, it'll look like a spreadsheet, but all you're really doing is focusing on one particular area, and it should be straightforward if you're familiar with what these relationships are here, okay? Marginal revenue because marginal cost is a powerful relationship, and it goes across all industries. But here, we're, we're simply saying in perfect competition, and only perfect competition, price equals marginal revenue because marginal cost, hence zero economic profit in the long run. Economic profit is possible in the short run, right? And, and this, this egg example is just perfect, you know? When we said it's possible in the short run, where... You know, the price was was rising, rising, rising for eggs. But there's nothing special about eggs. I mean, if we could all produce eggs at home, we probably would. Probably some of us do. I mean, we, we started hearing stories about eggs being smuggled across the border just because the price was so high. Well, you see good smuggling whenever the price is a differential in price between one market and the other. Um, that's an example of the fact that that, well, that monopoly price is only temporary cannot sustain itself and it will revert back. And we're already starting to see the price of eggs fall. Not quickly. I, I mean, I, I understand they're still higher than they were. But, I mean, these adjustments aren't lightning fast, but they're pretty fast. I mean, they really are. Okay. So those are things you want to know uh, with regard to cost in, in perfect competition, uh, and, and especially this issue of long-term economic profit. Um, know what the difference between marginal revenue is and what, and what marginal cost is. Marginal revenue is simply defined as the change in revenue given the change in output. So it's it's this one of these incrementals. And so remember the term marginal, I think a lot of people hear the word marginal and they sort of think, okay, it's it's tiny, it's you know, because you might say, okay, LeBron James's performance was marginal at best, you know, the last game. I think we would interpret that in everyday speech to think it was not contributing very much and whatnot. And that may be true, but and it may even be true, but it doesn't really matter because you'd be talking about a big increment, it's just incremental, not tiny. And not tiny. And, and I know that a lot of textbooks will say the next unit or the next unit or the next unit. Well, that assumes that you know you can account for the the act, I mean the, the cost of one unit when you're producing, you know, tens of thousands of ears of corn or bushels of wheat or whatever. Um, it's really whatever you whatever you want to capture. Maybe it's 10,000 marginal revenue for 10,000 bushels versus marginal cost of 10,000 bushels or, or whatever. Okay. So know about those uh, particular relationships there. Um, let me see. I'm sorry, I'm kind of moving around here. I've got my, I got to run back on the screen so I can see what I'm doing. Um, okay, also know about the difference between fixed and variable costs. Fixed and variable costs. So there are, what are, and what do we say about fixed costs? We said they are independent of, of, of uh, activity. So a firm could shut down, right, and not operate at all, but fixed costs will go on and on. And, and, it's, and we talked about some examples of this. And examples are, are things that uh, are not related to the production of the good itself, 
but are there to support the overall activity. Things like lease expense on the premises, things like interest expense, maybe. Could be. Depends on what you want to. But they're clearly fixed in nature. Insurance costs, uh, benefits costs for employees, all those are, and they're not related to the production of goods, really. Um, so all those are examples of those. And those go on even before you get going, which is one reason why those in and of themselves represent barriers to entry when they're very, very high. It takes a while to get over that, just, just to jump over those fixed costs in order to start earning profit. Okay. Okay. Um, also know about this. We, we talked about our two um, natural monopoly. It was first covered in chapter seven, but it's the idea of economies of scale. And so what about economies of scale and what are they? And economies of scale are simply the, the decline in average costs as output increases. This is really an explainer as to why big firms get bigger and why smaller firms sometimes have, have trouble competing. It's because some firms are well along their, their long run average cost curve. And I'll swivel the camera here so you guys can see this on the video. But, but I'm going to talk about the specific with regard to what we call natural monopoly, natural monopoly. And let me see here. I gotta get I gotta bring up my camera so I know what how far to go here. So there we go. Okay, so when we talk about trying to graph a long run average cost curve, let's just put dollars on this axis, output on this axis here. And we've got this long run average cost curve with something like that. Okay. And this could go on this range here that we call minimum efficient scale could go on for a while. And uh, in fact, what's it's probably easier just to draw this is a little bit more like that. I think that's probably a little bit better, a little flatter. And we simply call it the long run average total cost curve. All it is is simply, what it really is is simply a, a mathematical summation adding up of all the short run average, average cost curves, which are these sort of U-shaped uh, curves that we talked about back then. But here's what's important to know about for this particular section. That there are some firms, natural monopolies are in this condition in which Demand for the product is right here. It's relatively price inelastic. And that is, it's very steep. We're going to pay for electricity almost regardless of the price. And, what, and remember what natural monopolies are. Remember what a natural monopoly is. It's a type of structure in which only one firm can really supply the, the, the goods for the, the market because two firms, it's not economical and it's, it's just chaos. And so we tolerate those kinds of monopolies, but we tolerate them with regulation. So the best example are, are your utilities like electric and gas and water. And so like in our market here, p and is the only electricity provider. So why do we tolerate just one monopoly provider? Why can't they just double and triple our electric bills? Well, we do it because they have to get regular, regulatory approval. And here's why. Here's why we don't have more competitors. So if you've got one competitor here, and then what happens is if you get a new competitor, everyone now, we split the, the market share two ways. And now each has a half and the, and the price goes up. So ATC1 then goes to ATC2. And it simply results in an uneconomical level of output. And all we're talking about here is whatever this output level is here, it's simply now, if we're splitting it equal, it's now one half of that. In other words, they're dividing the market share equally. Assuming that they're dividing it equally, it doesn't really make any difference what that ratio is. There's no question they're going to slide up along that curve. And one reason why is because a lot of their inputs are fixed in nature. And think about average fixed costs is they fall over time. All those input costs are fixed. And so as a result, what you see happening here is you're going to have, there's no economical justification for more competitors in, um, in natural monopolies. Okay. So this is why we tolerate natural monopolies. And um, it's simply because economics don't reward competition. It don't really encourage uh, competition in any, in any meaningful sense. Okay. All right. Questions so far about anything we talked about? Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. And then another difference between fixed and variable costs is simply fixed costs are those costs, in, in, independent of output, variable costs, and those which vary directly with the level of value. Okay. Um, and then there are a couple questions doing what would be, what are some examples of those? And those are uh, those are important to know. Okay, uh, let me see here. There's a question: being able to compute profit and loss, and here all we're talking about when we talk about profit, and which is the goal of the business, it's simply p the pi, pi, pi symbol. It's total revenue minus total cost, and that's always always the case. Total revenue itself is simply the price of the good times the quality of the good. 
And then total costs are simply fixed cost plus variable cost. Okay, and then that equals the, the profit figure. Okay. And if you if you want to jump into the costs, your implicit costs or opportunity costs, you could do so, and you'll be notified if, if you are faced with that scenario. But that's in general the, the basic relationship everywhere, everywhere in terms of how to determine profitability. Simply total revenues, which are inflows, minus total costs, which are outflows. Okay, pretty straightforward. Know what those are about. Know that they're fixed and variable cost elements of it. So you want to want to make sure you can. Back, okay. Okay. Just accounting for. Uh, yeah. This is, well, no. It could be. It could be implicit. It could be economic profit if you have specifically included it here. And, and what I said is, if if we have, we'll include it. But it's 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 not going to be. There won't be any data as to what we're asking for. Okay. It'll it'll be it'll be obvious. Okay. Um. Let's see here. Okay, and then to just know how to compute some of these average costs. Remember, and I bring up average fixed cost, and I brought it up a minute ago because here's the thing about average fixed cost. Average fixed cost, it's important because it really contributes to this idea of economies of scale. It's simply the fixed cost over output. And if output goes up over time and fixed costs do not, they stay fixed, then obviously this number, this ratio is going to go down, 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 down. That's the beauty of of scale for those who are enjoying the benefits of scale. And that is, as you produce more output, this goes up and this doesn't do anything. And it just kind of stays fixed, right? It just kind of stays where it is. So we'll say it's equal to one another. And so as a result, this ratio is going to go down and you lower your average. And this is what we call operating leverage. And that's the idea that as you get bigger, you don't need to have any additional equipment. You know, if you've got, you know, one production line, that's probably suffices up to a certain point. Now, after, we talked about this in the last segment of the class where at some point you're going to run out of fixed cost or the inputs that we're going to use up those, those inputs. You have to jump to the next level and you have to, it's usually sort of spiky and what we call lumpy because you really can't add half a machine or a tenth of a manager or whatever. But in the short run, this is what we're talking about is this idea of bringing that, that down, okay? So that's what's, uh, what's going on uh, there, okay? Um, let me see here. Um, and then know about what diseconomies of scale are, and that's the opposite condition over here. And that is on out to the right here. Diseconomies of scale are a condition in which costs are rising as you produce more output. And so as a result, you keep going in this direction, you end up raising costs. And this is why, particularly we talked about this with regard to structure and oligopoly in particular. And we said that one of the trends that's going on in the business world right now is that the firms which are, which are experiencing Diseconomies of scale, that is, as they push this direction, the, the cost is going up, are downsizing, they're spinning off operations. And we're starting to see businesses, these very large firms, become a little bit more tightly uh, defined. And they're getting rid of things that don't make sense for them because it just doesn't make sense from a cost standpoint. And all kinds of other implications from a management standpoint as to whether or not you want to get into all these diverse businesses that have nothing to do with one another. Okay? All right, so that's the question dealing with that with regard to structure. Okay, um, let me see here. Also a question dealing with, in, in perfect competition, and let me go back, let me kind of come back here to perfect competition in a minute, and I want to um, sort of draw out the, the, the diagram, the, the graph here in perfect competition, because it really is something that is, it's significant from our, our standpoint, and um, it's different from that um, the, other, the other three structures. So I'm going to go and erase this, and we're still talking here about perfect competition. And so, what do we got going on here with perfect competition? Again, we've got actually. Let me do this because <clears throat> it's it's really the more I'll give you an even more inclusive view. So we this is the only structure we, which we've got this sort of split screen view. We got the price, the, the PQ plane that represents any the first market uh, that we looked at, and we've got the smaller P, smaller Q for the firm itself. And we said, okay, look, you've got a supply curve for the industry looking like that. You've got a demand curve for the industry or market. Again, the term industry and market is used interchangeably here. And then as a result, you've got some sort of equilibrium price, and it's a market price. And we say that the firm takes that price as given, okay? So that price is a given, we say these firms are price takers, and it doesn't matter how much output they produce, they can't influence the market price. And so 
As a result, the, and the demand curve is effectively the marginal revenue curve. I'm sorry if that's a little bit over to the side there. Demand and marginal revenue are the same. And all firms in all industries are going to want to produce where marginal revenue is marginal cost. So the supply curve is the marginal cost curve. And so they're going to produce at this level of output right there. Okay. And that is the profit maximizing quantity. Even if that profit is zero, economic profit. Okay. So all firms in all industries are going to want to produce at that level. Okay. But here's the problem. And that is this we've only talked about marginal cost, which is simply the cost reflection of the supply curve. What we haven't gotten into is are things like, uh, let's say we're operating here and, and let's say the average uh, total cost is somewhere here. And that's a good thing, right? Because here the price at this level of output, the price is here, cost per unit is here. And so that's a profitable situation, but that's not always the case, okay? And let's talk about some other examples of cases in which it's not, it's not the same as making a profit because we know that is, is often the case. So we have marginal revenue looking something like that. It's just a given whatever that price is, is, is taken in the market. And okay, let me put that over there. Okay, all right. Now, what if we have a condition in which you've got this kind of thing going on? We got a price down here and you've got an average total cost curve right there, okay? That's a bit of a problem because now you've got a bit of a loss happening, okay? So that's that's something to consider. Now, firm will operate there, okay? And in fact, there's a point at which if the price were between here and here, then the firm is actually getting a loss going. On. But if the price were here, where the price equals the average total cost, we simply refer to that as the break-even point, right? If price equals average, average variable cost. And so if we were to say, okay, we've got a different price here, We'll call that D prime MR prime. Okay. I don't know if you guys can see that or not. That's hard to see there. But so you've got a condition which price exactly was average total cost. It's a break even price. But here's the thing the firm will operate all the way down to a point at which, they'll, even if the price went out to, to fall, 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 you know, what if, the, what if the, the average variable costs are down here? The firm will still produce output, but they'll, they'll stop producing output here. Where I should put this in, keep the color scheme the same here with price, but double prime. Okay. And that is where the price equals the average variable cost. And that's what we call the shutdown point. This is where the firm will shut down. I know that sounds counterintuitive because you might be saying, okay, why don't we shut down here? Because of the fact that, that we, we're just now breaking even, let's just shut down. And if we're not shutting down there, why don't we shut down here where we've got a loss where Marginal revenue is here, and we've got the cost of production there. Why don't we shut down? Why are we going all the way down here to where average variable cost is? And it's simply because of the fact that if you're not at minimum covering average variable cost, what are you doing at all? You're not, there's no point. The assumption also is that if the price is less than average total cost, meaning you've got an economic loss going on, then at least maybe you can hang in there for a time. You might be able to hang in there for a time. And so when we talk about these relationships, just, let's just make clear that we've got this. If the price is greater than average total cost, then we have a positive economic profit. This is maybe something to kind of write down and keep for yourself. If the price is exactly equal to average total cost, it's the break-even point. If the price is less than average total cost, then the firm is earning a negative economic profit, also known as economic loss. But, but once, the, once that price keeps falling all the way down to average variable cost, that's considered a shutdown point. That's when we pull the plug and we close down. And, and you might, again, this idea of why don't we shut down here or, or even here, this makes even, if this makes sense, this even makes even more sense. And this really doesn't seem to make sense if we let this price go all the way down. But there are some real practical implications in perfect competition for not wanting to do that. Among those, in fact, how easy it is to restart operations once the price magically pops back up and now you're you got a profit. Maybe you get back in, maybe you can't, but you've also got to bring employees back. You bring the same employees back. I can very well see the same employees saying, yeah, thanks, we don't want the job anymore. Now that you fired us last month or last six months ago, uh, we're not interested in coming back to your, you know, to this rickety situation. That's understandable, it's difficult. Shutting down is easier said than done. It sounds like it's, Fairly easy just in a textbook, but in reality, there are lots of problems. 
canceling leases, getting out of loan contracts, maybe taking bankruptcy. These are not um, small decisions. And I know that sometimes I think we get this idea that, that, that business people are sort of cavalier with personnel decisions that they'll simply lay people off on a whim. Not so much, really. I mean, I think some agonize over it, believe it or not. And um, and I saw this from my standpoint as being a bank lender where a lot of firms just really lost, owners lost a lot of sleep over having to lay people off. They felt really guilty about it. And uh, because it really is an upsetting thing, no question about it. So these are not like business decisions, which is why firms will let that price go all the way down before they do something about it. So know what the shutdown point is all about. Got it? Um, okay, let me see here. The price takers and perfect competition. And uh, let me see here. They take the price that's given in the market, prevailing market conditions. Also know that in perfect competition, the only real decision is they can make is not a pricing decision, it's simply an output decision. How much they produce? You know, they'll produce at this point at which uh, uh, marginal revenue was marginal cost. And so as a result, that's really the only decision they have to make from a price quantity standpoint is how much to produce. Because the price is given, they can't do anything about the price. They can't influence the market price. So they will take the price as given. Okay. Uh, any questions? How do I do this? Okay. Let's see here. Okay. And again, you want to do a couple of graphs. I think they, they should be fairly straightforward as to what you're, and a couple of tables, you're going to want to look at those and know what, what is going on. But I think I pretty much covered what we're uh, going over there. Okay. All right. Um, okay. Please make sure it helps. Give me a second here, because okay. All right. Okay. Um, know also about um, the difference between total revenue and total cost. That's simply the the, the amount of profit. That's all. It's that calculation there. So know what that's about. Um, okay. Let's see here. I think that's all we had about perfect competition. I just want to make sure I'm not, not missing anything that I wanted to talk to you about on this. Okay, okay what about monopolies? Okay, so what, what do we say about monopolies? Monopolies are these structures in which um, one firm dominates the market. And we said that, you know, even though I know that some people will say, well, how can, how can a firm be a monopoly if they do have some competition? Well, some competition is actually the norm in a monopoly situation. Particularly outside of natural monopolies, there is some competition. But then there are some examples of firms that sort of almost are, are example, are, are you know, are perfect examples of, of these kinds of structures. And so you want to have an idea, like like utilities. We said oftentimes are the case. Retail is not a monopoly business. And I know sometimes people look at, at big big retailers like Home Depot or Walmart and say, oh, they're a monopoly, but not really. And in fact, even though Walmart's got a gigantic market presence in retail, they don't behave like a monopolist because what is a, how does a monopolist behave? They charge above market prices. Well, Walmart specifically does not do that. That's how they got as large as they are. But they're really operating in much more perfectly competitive markets. So I think it's important to know what kinds of examples of, of these industries are. And I gave the examples of all, in all four of these market scenarios, these market structure scenarios as to what we're, we're talking about. Okay. Uh, okay, let me see here. Okay, um, and know what a definition of monopoly is. There's no, really substantially no competition in the market. Um, the, the demand curve for the industry is the demand curve for the, uh, for the monopoly itself. So there is no split screen view like what we have in perfect competition. And a monopolist will always maximize profits by producing what marginal revenue equals marginal cost. Okay, so they don't have to really worry about competition. This is why we say that firms and monopolies are considered to be price makers. Now, remember that when we talked about this idea of, of price takers and price makers, we said firms in perfect competitions are, are price takers, firms in monopoly are price makers. So these are pretty opposite um, types of structures, aren't they? And so here, when we talk about monopoly and, and, and well, in imperfect competition in general, we go back to this idea of 
I'll leave that up there for those of you who are in the room here for the perfect competition market model. But in Monopoly and, and indeed for all those, those last three structures, we've got a difference between marginal revenue and demand. That's not the same. Remember, it's the same in perfect competition, but it's not the same in the others. So as a result, we've got this kind of thing going on. We've got a demand curve looking something like that, right? It doesn't matter how steep or flat it is. It's not really our point here. And a marginal revenue curve, which always lies to the left of and is steeper than that. And a marginal and a supply or a marginal cost curve looking something like that. Okay. And the firm in all industries is going to want to produce more marginal revenue equals marginal cost. That's their profit maximizing quantity. And what they'll do is they'll simply mark the price of the good up, charge the price at whatever the market is willing to pay for it. So, and typically they are earning economic profit, at least in the short run. So you can say that very often we've got a case in which you know, the average total cost curve is coming in somewhere there. And again, if price is greater than average total cost, and all that area there is profit, okay? And that's often what we see happen. It's what is really expected in a monopoly. It's one of the things that monopolists enjoy um, that other structures do not, okay? So again, just remember that idea of marginal, re where marginal revenue is marginal cost is the, where, is the place in which a firm wants to operate, okay? Okay, any questions so far? Um, I think we talked enough about natural monopoly, that is the idea that, that they, they operate in a, in a place in which no two firms can profitably supply the market. And the, the lowest cost is only one producer yet. Oh, the John Don Six makes me said the same way it's been. That's like the uh, same hasn't started yet. It hasn't started yet? Oh no, because I'm recording. I, I know some. It's actually kind of goofy today. It says it's recording. Okay, no, I believe you. I believe you. Um, okay. I, yeah, I, 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 that's why I said early on, I, I, it, it was not acting right. <laughs> it was like that. All right, well, now it looks like we did get kicked out. Oh, well, at least we're recording this and I'll post the video. So whatever we missed. I don't think I can do this without stopping my previous recording. Yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to lose. I don't want to lose the recording. So, all right. So, so I know that for those of you who are watching the video of this, what he's saying is the Zoom link went down, and um, and it looks like it did. But it wasn't acting right when I first started this up. I don't know what was going on. But I think about. It, I'm afraid if I stop it now, I'll lose what I've got. So, for those of you who. Uh, are watching this video later and wondering what the heck happened. That's what happened. We are live. We're still doing it, but I'm recording it. So, uh, I'll, and I, I'll make it available just as soon as I can afterwards because I realize I'm going to make the exam available as well. I, thank you for bringing that up because I, I wasn't I wasn't sure what was happening because it just didn't look like it was working. Right. So, all right. Well, okay. Well, a little bit. I guess this is like live TV here. We we, we take what we, what we get. So. All right, let's uh, let's go back to where we were with the exam, and um, let me sort of pick up from where we were before here. Let me see. Okay. Um, okay. Um, okay. So know about this idea of intellectual property and and what it means as a barrier to entry. That anybody can really have a monopoly if they can get something like a patent or a copyright or a trademark. Okay. Patents are specifically for products or processes that give the owners of those patents exclusive rights to produce that particular good for a period of time. Copyrights are, are on intellectual property, primarily uh, works of art and um, musical recordings, books, things of that nature. There's an interesting uh, bit of discussion about the Sonny Bono Copyright Extension Act. Sonny Bono, of course, was a singer back in the day and later became a member of Congress. Um, and it was, it was enacted shortly after he died, and so it was in, in honor of him. But it extended that life, it extended the copyright, the, the, the monopoly protection. So that's good for those who have that um, protected. Okay. Okay. Uh, let me see here. All right. So let's talk about the, the, the last three, uh, last two subjects, or last two structures monopolistic competition. And oligopoly. What do we say about oligopoly? We said that they're strategically interdependent. There was a definition that we provided earlier on. They're strategically interdependent, and it means that because there are only a few competitors, 
that they're all watching each other and they, they know what each other is doing. And because they're watching each other, uh, we have this behavior where we have a leading firm, following firm type of behavior where one firm does something and, and I know we, we typically think of it as a, as a price change, everybody else follows suit, but it's not just that, it's also connected to the thing like the form of the product itself. And I talked, and this sounds like maybe a, sort of a trivial example, but I think it's a perfect example one that a lot of us are familiar with, and that's when the first broadcaster that did NFL football games had the yellow, the yellow line to show where the first down line was, and then suddenly everybody else had it. And uh, it was just something that they do. And when CNN first had the scroll at the bottom of what was going on with current news events, everybody else had the scroll at the bottom. That's a perfect example of leading and following behavior, uh, whether it's price related or not. So this interdependence is the idea that one firm does something Everybody else follows suit, particularly if it works. Okay. When we talk about um, oligopoly, barriers to entry are a really big thing. It's really hard to compete in some industries because of the fact that it's so expensive to get in, or you simply can't get in because of even legal issues like trying to get a license. Not everybody can start a broadcasting operation simply because you have to have a license. Or to get a drug company going, you have to have some kind of patent. Good. That's, that's anything special. Okay. Monopolistic competition, we said it's all about the product and, and uh, this idea of product differentiation. Product differentiation really means the firm can, uh, can charge a higher price than what a perfectly competitive price would be and achieve it through branding. So that's the thing that you want to remember mm -hmm. about that. Know also that, and then and when we talk about brands, we're talking about something which are identifiable. We talked about this idea that that there are a lot, that branding is such an important topic, and, and I know that that for the big one study marketing as a as a major that you won't need any convincing about the power of brands because we know they're important. You know, you buy the generic trash bags or you buy the Glad bags, you pay the higher price. You may buy the Glad bags because you know exactly what they're going to do. The generics, I don't know. Maybe they're not. Maybe they're crummy trash bags, and, and uh, you, know, you take the chance. In other words, you lose that sort of insurance when you buy a non-branded item. So you're actually paying a bit of premium to get what you know you're going to get. Something like Jif peanut butter or Budweiser or whatever it is, whatever the brand is, you know what you're going to get with a generic or a, a, a weekly branded product that you're not familiar with, not so much. Okay? Um, let me see. So differentiation uh, is just simply this idea of achieving it primarily through branding. Okay, so what else about... Uh, uh, we want to know about how we measure market power. Now, we define market power as being this idea, this, this ability to control price. And we said that one way to control price is by having fewer competitors. And we measured that by the use of what's called the Herfindahl Index, the herfindahl Hirschman Index. And remember what that, what that was about. We did an example on the board here where we, we talked about this index. The Herfindahl Index basically runs from zero to, to 10,000. Okay, so it's, but it's got to be somewhere greater than zero because because all you're doing is squaring market shares. You can't, the only thing that you can square to get zero is zero. Zero percent market share doesn't make sense, but 100% market share does. If you square 100, you get 10,000. So if there's one competitor with 100% market share, then that industry is going to have a 10,000 uh, score. So what do we say about that index? It's a way that the government primarily can, can ascertain the degree of market power and implicitly the flip side of that is the 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 lesser degree of competition and in this country we have a long-standing tradition of having competition on the supply side over um, you know the lack of competition and i know that we may be talking out of both sides of our mouth when we give patents and to drug companies and copyrights to artists and whatnot that's true but those will go away at some point and um and whether or not they can sustain that price afterwards is, is something quite different. But the Herfindahl Index basically says, look, if you've got few competitors, inherently the price is going to go up and it's going to disadvantage the demand side of the market. And to the extent that firms in these heavily concentrated structures can get their competition down to just a few, few of them, they can potentially engage in collusion. Now, collusion, we said, is this effort to, to agree on price and output, and it is a, uh, it's an illegal activity. Okay, so, um, and, and one of the things about the Herfindahl Index is if that number goes up, and why would it go up? One way it could go up very quickly is if one firm buys another firm. One competing firm buys another competing firm, and immediately that score jumps way up, and it may exceed that threshold 
of 1800 and it's not, I don't know that it's, it's written in stone that much because there are some structures out there that got very high indexes, but they're really heavily watched. But if you if two firms get together and join through a merger or acquisition, it's going to drive that score up and as a result, maybe disadvantage the demand side of the market because you've got now fewer in the market. So, and, and by the way, if you, if, you, if you follow these kinds of things, the government has detected merger requests and do, do so all the time. Um, AT&T tried to buy T-Mobile years ago and the government said no. And then Sprint tried, the government said no to them. And that happens. In Europe, you know, we don't often talk about the international piece of this, but GE tried to buy Honeywell and American regulators said, okay, European regulators. Oh, and so that didn't happen, not because they're, they're two American-based firms, but it was because the, so much of the operations are in Europe and European regulators put the, so it can happen when there's too much concentration in a particular market, competition in the European market to justify two big electrical firms getting together and, and, and doing what they do, okay? All right, um, and then we, we talked a bit about, and I said, have any questions about antitrust, but there are some in particular, what were the, the laws? You want to know what the laws were that, that really enacted antitrust. The Sherman Act of 1890 was the first. It basically um, prevented monopolies. And I know that, as I said at the outset of the class today, that this is probably better understood more from a legal standpoint than an economic one, because as I understand it, the, the, the Sherman Act and some of the enforcement have been watered down over the years because the idea is, and I think a lot of us in econ didn't weren't really appreciative of that, but during the Microsoft trial in the 90s, that it came out that the government will tolerate a monopoly as long as they're not that firm is not doing things to maintain its monopoly, which unfortunately for Microsoft, they were. They're trying to keep competitors out. And the logic behind that is very simple. You, if you have no competition, that may not be your fault. I mean, it just may simply be the fact that you're very the first in the market and nobody can replicate what it is you do. And so as a result then that uh, is, is, that's not your fault. And, and it's, now, if you try to keep them out for whatever reason, then that's a different issue, okay? And we had the Clayton Act of 1914. One of the things that one did was interlocking you know, directorate says you can't have directors sitting on competing firms, uh, on, on the board of competing firms. That's considered to be uh, an uncompetitive outcome. Okay, questions so far about any of this? Okay, uh, let's see here. Okay, let's talk about the last topic, externalities, okay? So there'll be some examples of externalities. And remember, we did this just a couple days ago, this idea of different types of externalities. You've got positive and negative externalities. Positive externalities are basically spillovers onto unrelated third parties, uh, the economic effects of whatever the activity is. Sometimes they can be good, sometimes they can be bad, and they can be production uh, oriented, production originated or consumption originated. And we went through that, so I, I, I won't go through that matrix again, but just know what some of these examples are. They won't be really unusual. They'll be easy to categorize if you're familiar with what's, what's going on there, okay? But know what an extra reality is and how we, we sort of deal with it. There's also a question about this general, and I mentioned this a few minutes ago, this idea of what, what market failure is. Market failure is a sort of broader category of, of we talked about, and I went through some of the new class the other day. It's not, it's free ridership. We'll talk about that next week. It's um, it's all these things where markets don't always operate the way, they're not always operated as intended. So as a result, some sort of solution should happen. And let's talk about solutions to externalities, right? Then among those, one thing that we talked a bit about was this idea of the so-called cap and trade program where the government issues marketable pollution permits. And this sounds a little bit counterintuitive. Why would the government give you a right to pollute? Well, the recognition is there's gonna be always some amount of pollution. So why not just set a cap on the limit that you expect and then just permits and the firms that, that, that drop down below their allowable limits and then trade those to other firms that are less efficient. And as a result, they can earn income from doing that. And so as a result, what's the incentive the incentive is for everybody to reduce their emissions so they can sell those permits to those who are less efficient. And the idea is too, is that if you're less efficient over time, you know, the economically more efficient people will survive, the less efficient will not survive. But it, but it works to the benefit of society generally because we're bringing down this overall cap. And the overall cap has been coming down over, over the years. And there is a lot of evidence, particularly with, with air and water, um, 
I know that there's a lot of hole blue all. We, we are a cleaner society than what we were you know, 30, 40 years ago. We really are. It's, it's, it's working. We're not there yet, clearly. We've got a lot of global issues with regard to that, um, in particular, the idea of global climate change. It's related to that, but that's not going to be specifically what the, one that we'll be talking about here. Okay. Also, know about how we measure the impact of these externalities. When we talk about a positive externality, we said, okay, there's a benefit to society over and above the private benefit enjoyed by the consumers of the good or, and even by the producers of the good. Uh, and one of the examples we gave was something like um, uh, home ownership, for instance. People owning homes, that's a, that's a positive consumption externality. People owning homes is thought to, to make people more responsible to take better care of their homes if they own it, as opposed to not owning it. And as a result, it improves the value of neighborhoods, which is why real estate appraisers will always look at the area in which any home is located and they want to you know, try to determine the percentage of, of homeowners versus tenant uh, residents because tenants simply don't take care of property as much as they would owners do. And that's because they don't enjoy any private benefit at all. So why should they do it? No private benefit, no social benefit. Okay. So this example, we talked about vaccinations and whatnot. And uh, I know this is a, and I don't want controversy over vaccinations, but it's long been an example of that. Uh, negative, the big, the big negative externality we talked about over time is, is that of pollution. And it's far and away, of all externalities, it's far and away the most, uh, the most covered in, in all of those kinds of things. Okay. Um, so with the negative externality, then there's a marginal social cost social costs over and above the private cost to the producer, okay? We do about corrections to external. One of those, we could, we could talk about taxing it, or we could simply arrive at some sort of market-based solution. And so those were all examples of what we do about an external, okay? So in the case of, of a Pergovian tax, we simply tax the behavior. If it's a negative externality, if it's a positive externality, we can engage in a Pergovian subsidy where we, we fund that activity. Market-based solutions, cap and trade was one, the other was the coast. The coast theorem, we talked a bit about that and what that's about. Okay. All right. Well, I think that's about all that I had to talk about. Again, I apologize for those who tried to get on the Zoom. I was up there at one time and it just sort of went poof. I don't know what happened. Hopefully this video will make its way to YouTube link. So talk like there. If you do have questions about anything on the exam, feel free to get with me. Available and um, it'll be available from Sunday. Any questions for me? Anybody here? With me? Okay, well, have a great weekend. Thanks, and uh, see you all next time.